Okay, we're on page 617 in the name and edition. That's part 4, chapter 6, number 15. So in the red, that's 4615. In the white, that's page 617. <coughs> so, 617. Oh, in that one, it's um, part. Okay. So it's red, it's 4615. Hopefully, this week, what we're going to finish our discussion of davening and the spiritual impact of davening. And um, just as a short introduction, just to refresh what we've been talking about, we've been talking about a lot about uh, hashbos and shefa, which is we translated as God's spiritual energy. Um, Rabbi Naaman pointed out that there's really no good English word to um, translate it, but a lot of what we do during davening and when we fulfill a lot of the commandments, we bring down Hashem shefa, His spiritual energy, into the world, and it's, that's really what makes the whole world operate. Is Hashem. You know, putting energy into the world. I, I think I saw in the footnotes he likens it to um, electricity to have something uh, to have something work. If you don't have the electricity, the thing's not going to work. Right. And he's, there's different hashpos that Hashem hashpos that hashpos that Hashem sends down. For instance, the hashpo of Chaim of life. He says that if a person gets the total hashpo of life, then he's uh, he's very healthy. His life is going well. If that hashpo were, were to end, Hashem's influence, he would die. If the hashpa is weakened, he would have a very difficult life and be very sickly. So, really, everything that we that exists in the world comes about because Hashem is infusing with spiritual energy. Something I just—if you bought Rabbi Y. Y. Rubenstein's book um, that he was selling Thursday night, the one the, the, with the base of Mikdash on the top—he translates Tomer Devora, and he points out there. I think Nefshechaim might point this out also that. You only exist because at that moment Hashem wants you to exist and He's putting His Ashba into the world. And not only that, when you rebel against Hashem and you do a sin, you're really, you know, you're like shtaching the king. You're rebelling against Him. At that very time when you're rebelling against Hashem, He's at that moment actively giving you energy, <coughs> spiritual energy that you exist. So He's actually providing you the energy even to rebel against Him, which just shows the kindness of Hashem that He's willing to tolerate that as you're rebelling against the king of kings, he's allowing you and proactively making you exist at that point. But that's what we talk about when Hashbaz. So now when we, when we do mitzvahs, and specifically when we do davening, the, the Ramchal was talking about how we draw down more of that Hashbaz, that spiritual energy, to positively impact uh, the world. So we just finished last week about how davening Shemona Esrei and how there are very... Now, I guess when you get into Kabbalah, I don't know this, but you can ask the rabbis here who study Kabbalah that there are different types of hashbaz and how you draw them down. So that we're not getting into. But um, we, just, we did mention how davening, the way it was set up, draws down those specific spiritual influences in different ways. And now we're going to talk about... And we just finished uh, with Shemona Esrei last week, so now we're going to talk about the uh, rest of davening on page 617. Vihine. There are other things added to davening which cause Hashem's mercy to awaken and to increase blessing. What are these? Inyan Havidoi, confession. Haskaras Hashlosh Esrei Midos, the 13 attributes of mercy. Right, we say that in uh, the in Slichos and, before, and during Rosh Hashanah Kippur. Right, so that's what he's going on. The Ramchal is going based on Nusach Svard. And the Svardim say this before Tachnon, after Shemona Esrei, the uh, Svardim do the confession, right? The Nusach Svard also, the Sham Nebagad No Gazal Di And then they do the um, they they do the thirteen uh, attributes of, of mercy of Hashem. And after that, then they do Tachnon. The Ashkenazim don't do that. It was taken out because you may be surprised to learn that people were saying it very fast without having intent, and they figured I guess it was better to not say it without intent than to say it uh, without intent. It was better to not say it at all. But he's going with Nusach Sfar, and he's talking about these, uh, what, what the inner meaning of these parts of the prayer service are. Vahainu. So what's the vidoy when we confess our sins? So right after Shemona Esrei, they, you confess your sins. Ki ha vidoy hu liston pi ha v'lo yigrimu lo shetidachet vilasu chas v'shalom. It's to close the mouth of the accuser, accusers, meaning there are certain, let's call them bad spiritual forces, which try to say, don't listen to his prayer. He did a lot of sins. So when you confess your sins in front of Hashem, that prevents your prayer from being cast off. Because if these uh, spiritual forces will come in front of Hashem and say, hey, don't listen to this guy's prayer. He's a sinner. Then your prayer wouldn't be accepted. So by saying the vidoy, um, it kind of nullifies that effect when you say it sincerely. So it kind of, after reading this, it kind of makes you like want to put it back in davening. But uh, you know, we just do what's in the sitter, what Chazal set up for us. Okay, so that's the vidu. That's confessing the sins, right? The Hashem news. 
So then we say Haskaras Hashlosh Esrei Midos, the thirteen attributes of mercy, right? Hashem, right? Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum, Vechanun, Erech Hapaim. Question? I was just going to say, but oh, do you say you're Sephardi, right? Yeah, but I thought. You have an Ashkenaz. Oh, okay. But I was just going to ask. Uh, so, so don't do a Vigili, but uh, maybe Tachnun, maybe. Right. So that's a separate thing. But he's, he's going to talk about in a second what Tachnun does. Each of these three things, the Vidoy, the thirteen uh, attributes, and Tachnun does a separate thing to help the davening uh, be accepted by Hashem. But and he's going to talk about that. But next, the, the 13 attributes, right? That's the Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachem, Vechan. And we say it a lot during uh, Slichos and during... Um, we just said it last Sunday for Slichos during uh, 17th of Tammuz. Uh, and we say it more during Rosh Hashanah Kippur, the 10 days of repentance. That those 13 attributes, so what do they do? Zekocham sheyitvos ha'adun baruchu b'midas rachmanu. So that causes Hashem to grab onto his um, attribute of mercy. U'b'shlitas romamuso ya'avor al-pesha. And when his... Um, he port- his, his, when his, his exaltedness reigns, it causes Hashem to overlook sin. Now, Hashem just doesn't, it says that we're not allowed to say Hashem's a vatran. You're not allowed to say that Hashem just forgets sin, right? Everything is written in front of Hashem. But something that the Ramchal talks about is that there are different ways that Hashem deals with the world, right? We said the whole purpose of existence is to, um, the whole purpose of our lives, right? Hashem wanted to bestow goodness upon people. Now, if Hashem would just give us goodness, then we would feel embarrassed. Well, we didn't deserve it. So rather, He puts us in a physical world where we have challenges to, to we have challenges that prevent us maybe from wanting to serve Hashem, and we overcome those challenges, and therefore we earn reward because we did what we were supposed to, and then Hashem bestows reward upon us. So it could have been that Hashem just put us in a world that each one of us has individual challenges, and we have to overcome them. You know, kind of like a video game. You just have to like get past the stage, but there's really no purpose to humanity, to the, to the entire world. But that's not how Hashem made the world. The way Hashem made the world is that there is a purpose of creation. The whole world is going to a point. There is a purpose of the entire creation that the whole world should recognize that as Hashem is one. So sometimes, so there's two ways that Hashem deals with the world. One is reward and punishment. When we do something good, we get rewarded. When we do something bad, we get punished. But also, and Another aspect of how Hashem deals with the world is that He wants the world to go to that ultimate purpose where humanity recognizes Him as one. And sometimes, he, the way He does reward and punishment, it could be that He's not going to punish or reward exactly how it might be otherwise if it's going to affect the way Hashem is trying to bring the world to the ultimate goal. So if we, when we say the 13 attributes of uh, mercy, we cause Hashem to use this um, attribute of, uh, of exaltedness, which means that he's trying to push the world the, uh, to its ultimate conclusion, and since he's doing that, he might, he might not treat sins as harshly as he would otherwise. When we invoke that attribute of Hashem, that he's trying to push the world along, um, it, it might not be like that. And it also works the other way. The, the Ramchal talks about in Das Tfunos that really the fact that the Jews went down to Egypt and were enslaved that was a very harsh punishment for the small sin that was done. But since that it was important that the Jewish people go to Egypt so that they can leave Egypt with the ten plagues and then get the Torah, and that was integral for human history, to have the Jewish people that would eventually bring about this message that God is one, it was important that that happened and um, to push world history along, even though it doesn't fit into the strict definition of reward and punishment. Now, it's not that Hashem is overlooking sins or punishing when we don't deserve it. It's just that the certain midos of, of rachamim might not be invoked, of mercy might not be invoked, or they will be um, invoked. Um, is that clear? He's saying Hashem is looking at a bigger picture. There's two things, right? There's You get rewarded and punished for your deeds, and also there's a bigger picture of how the history of the world is supposed to go. So if we invoke that mida of Hashem, that attribute of Hashem, He will not overlook, well, I guess that's the... He, so anything that's going to that's gonna affect the long-term purpose of, of creation... If we could somehow tap into that, right? That's what the the, the Yid Gimel Midas do is that we tap into that aspect of Hashem's providence, and it will He will be more merciful for us, and in a way overlook the sins that we did. That we won't be judged with the strict attribute of of, of justice and um, of Harba <laughs> Onish. So that's what we do when we say the Yud Gimel Midas. And another another reason why you would want to seemingly say this after davening, but we don't. So, okay. And we could also, he'll be merciful for us um, if we don't have the merits necessarily. So those are the two things that we don't say. Now, what Reuven was mentioning, why do we say tachnun? We put our heads down, 
after Shmona Esrei. Af hi kniya gedol lefan of Yisbarach. That's also a tremend- showing a tremendous amount of humility in front of Hashem. Asher kocho gadol l'shetis pious midas hadin. That it has a tremendous power to assuage the attribute of strict justice. V'yikamer harach v'yim hagadolim. And it arouses great mercy. V'yah hashefa nimshach v'ribuy avervacha. So that Hashem shefa, the spiritual energy, should come down in, um, in great abundance. So right, when you put, you're putting your head down, right, Hashem doesn't like arrogance. He doesn't like haughtiness. So after Shemona Esra, you put your head down and you're like confessing and you're saying the um, tachnon, that is a tremendous power to humble yourself in front of Hashem and to allow all of the shefa and Hashem's, um, Hashem's uh, abundance to come down. Okay. So the Ramchal continues. Ulam zehu seder hakolel sha'alav nosta hatfila. This is the general form that... Um, the davening was set forth. There are many, many details. Right, he's just talking about the, how davening was set up in a general sense, but there are more reasons why each verse, let's right, say, in Pesukah the Zimmer was put where it was, and why these specific Tehillim were chosen, and why every word in davening is important, but he's not going through that now, he's just talking about the general, um, the general sense. Okay? You have to know. The world, the let's try to finish the part of davening today. Is that okay? Feel free. You can. You're allowed to leave if you, if you need to. But you need to know. The the day is set up into two parts. It's the morning. And that's the afternoon, which is after midday. Also, the night is set up into two parts. Like we mentioned earlier. And according to each part of the day, we have to have um, Hashem's Shafa, His abundance coming down according to what part of the day it is. Right, so the world, the day, sorry, the day is set up in four separate parts. That's the morning, the afternoon, the first half of the night, and the second half of the night. And based on what part of the day it is, it is what part of the day it is, it has a different shefa, a different type of spiritual energy that we're trying to draw down uh, from Hashem. And according to the different parts of the day, that's how Chazal set up the different parts of davening. For example, the morning, we have the prayer service of Shachris. And then in the afternoon, we have the prayer service of Mincha. Now you ever wonder why Shachris is the longest service? The reason is, is because in the morning, that's when the main part of spiritual energy of the day comes down. When the day starts, that's the main spiritual energy. So in order to tap into it, to maximize it, we have the longest service, which is Shachris. Now for the second half of the day, which is the afternoon, you only need a little bit of effort according to um, just to complete that aspect of the Shefa coming down. Meaning, at the afternoon has a certain aspect of Hashem's energy coming into the world, but it's really just a completion of the spiritual energy which, co- which comes about in the morning. So the main spiritual energy is in the morning, and that continues in Mincha, which is in the afternoon. So that's why the Mincha service is very long, because we're trying to tap into all that spiritual energy, whereas Mincha is uh, just a continuation of that, and the service is significantly shorter. Uba Laila, what about night? Now, at nighttime, it's a little more, um, there's a little more new aspect of spiritual energy coming into the world. Because, right, morning and afternoon are similar that they're both day, but night is a whole new, whole new thing. Right, the difference, right, the difference between afternoon, morning and afternoon is less than the difference between afternoon and night. Alkane, therefore, Therefore, the Marv service, the evening service, is longer than Mincha. Right? It's shorter than Shachris, because the main Shefa comes into the world during the morning. But, and, but it's longer than Mincha, because Mincha is just a continuation of that Shachris service, whereas Marv at night is a new aspect. But that new aspect isn't greater than in the morning. Vahainu. Right? We have the blessings of Shema in the, in the evening. However, the evening service is shorter than the morning service. Because still, oh, it sounds like even the 
shefa, the spiritual energy which comes about in the evening, really its source is in the morning. So even though we always say the Jewish day starts in the evening, still the main shefa, the main spiritual energy that goes into the world that we want to tap into happens during the morning. Now later we're going to learn about Shabbos and about how the main spiritual energy for the week comes about through Shabbos. Also, tefillah, the prayer service corresponds to the service of the Mikdash. On the base Hamikdash, night follows day. Oh, that would also. All right, also very nice. All right, it's interesting here because he, he's going to tie it into the Avos, which I, I was curious why he didn't mention it, um, why he didn't tie it in so much to the uh, to the base Hamikdash coming up. But we'll see. Okay, ve'ulam lechelik hashini shalat. So if you remember, we said there's a fourth part of the day, which is after midnight. If you'll notice, there's no prayer service. <laughs> what? Yeah. We have trouble getting a minute for I had a friend. I had a friend in high school who was Muslim, and he's, I, I thought it was hard having to daven. You know, he davens five times a day, and he they have to get up. I think at a certain time, so he would have to like wake up at five a.m. if he wanted to pray at the right time. I was like, yeah. well, man. So he didn't do it because. So Muslims also have a problem getting the bacher up for shachris, in, in their religion also. Okay. <laughs> in. Uh, at the second half of the night, there's there's no prayer service that was instituted. Like Rabbi Stewart said, because it would be too much on the congregation, right? You have to everyone every night has to come at JLC at 1 a.m. to have a separate service. Wouldn't wouldn't go over so well. Imagine getting a minion then. However, it was given over to very pious people, to pious people, that they should get up and they should uh, pray. They should pray according each one according to his. Uh, how, how he feels. He says, not only that, really, um, according to the letter of law, Marav is a Rishus. It's not a obligatory prayer service. It's just that since people accepted it upon themselves, it became obligatory. But in its true essence, it's not an obligatory prayer service, whereas Shachos and Mincha are. Now he's, he's going to can. Right. So it comes out that there is a service, right? Again, if you've ever been to the Kotel at midnight, you'll see very holy people come and they'll say this special prayer service at midnight, which is really optional for very um, holy people. What, and it, What's it called? It's called Tikkun Chatzos. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, I'm not amongst those holy people, so oh. can, can ask, I mean, ask, it's, can it's ask the other holy people here. It's about and the destruction of the temple and how we long for the building of the temple and for... God to if you want to start one in Manalapan, we could all you know, we could institute it here. I'm up at that time. Maybe. Yeah, well, you, it's because you were sleeping and you're already up for the day, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Most people aren't. Uh... Anyway, okay. Vihine tira ki hashalosh tefilos, the three parts of davening. Avos tiknum, the our forefathers set them up. Umitzad zem mutal al kol Since our forefathers set up the different prayer service, that's how we uh, do it. Veulam tikun chazi halayla. However, in the middle of the night, haachrona David nizdarzbo. King David was very careful about it. At midnight, I'll get up to thank you. So he says that the King David, we mentioned a few weeks ago, wanted to be on the same level as the forefathers. Uh, but he wasn't. He's a little below the forefathers, even though he's quite high up there. And we said that it's really King David who takes the ideas of the forefathers and puts it into practice because a Jewish king, his job of a Jewish king is to make sure the Jewish people are following the laws of Hashem. And that's what King David did. So King David um, instituted the prayer service at midnight, or he was very careful about it. So that's affiliated, associated with him. So while we have Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were the forefathers. The prayer services they set up, those are really obligatory, and those we say. But what King David set up, since he is on a lower level, it's really just for the holy people, and it's not obligatory upon every Jew. Let's just finish. On holy days we add Davni, connected Korban and Musaf. Right, what's the idea of Musaf? It's to tap into this, the, we only say that on holy days like Shabbos and Yantiv, to tap into this spe- extra level of spirituality. And that has to do with the added level of spiritual, spiritual energy available on that day. Okay, and that's finished, we finished here with um, the daily service and with davening. And next week, God willing, we're going to talk about the parts of um, Judaism that just happened at certain times of the year, starting with uh, Shabbos, which happens once a week, and we'll talk about the spiritual aspects of that. So when you mentioned before that Shabbos, that the spiritual energy of Shabbos affects the whole week, that's going to be in the next chapter? It's either in the next chapter or something else I saw over Shabbos from the Ramchal. We'll we'll find out next week. I don't remember. Yeah, but he is. uh,